Hello, I am Petal Modest. Welcome to Parenting for the Future. As we speak, a third of the world's population is on lockdown to slow the spread of the coronavirus. This virus, as you know, has infected more than 2 million and claimed the lives of over 142,000 people. Many of us are working at home while trying to school our children. Millions have lost their jobs, their businesses, but the bills keep coming. We are all worried about friends, family members, loved ones with pre-existing conditions or who might be older. Healthcare workers are in what must feel to them like the longest ER shift of their lives. And they, like those who manufacture, sell, and bring us food and keep our countries and states running, all of them are in dire need of personal protection equipment so that they can stay healthy. So I am really thrilled to be joined by Dr. Daria Long Gillespie today. Many of you may know Dr. Daria as a medical expert on CNN, HLN, The Dr. Oz Show, among many others. Uh, she also writes frequently on uh, Instagram at drdaria.com, but she is also a mother to two wonderful children, the author of a best-selling book called Mom Hacks, a TEDx speaker, and a Yale and Harvard trained emergency physician who still works in the ER. So today, we are going to talk about how we can apply lessons from her ER life to help all of us not just survive these challenging times, but thrive. Welcome, Dr. Daria, to Parenting for the Future. Hi, Petal. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure, and we really need you today. So I want to start by asking you about a term that you used in uh, a TEDx talk that you gave some time ago, and the term is crazy mode. And I am not completely sure what crazy mode means, but I could tell you that it feels like this is exactly where I am these days. So tell us what exactly is crazy mode. Yes. Crazy mode or crazy busy mode is, you know, those moments when you people say, how are you doing? Oh, it's just crazy. It's just crazy busy right now. And as an ER doctor, we are used to functioning in those moments of the biggest chaos. And, and we don't have that luxury of saying, you know, I'm, I'm just crazy right now. I'm a little bit stressed. You know, I know you're having a heart attack, but I'm kind of stressed right now. I need you to come back. We don't have that luxury. So I started to think, what am I doing in the emergency department that enables me to not be in crazy busy mode, to be able to stand there and say that whatever comes in through those double doors of the ER, I've got this, I can handle it. What is that? And how do I take that and apply those lessons to my life to end that feeling of being crazy? That's where the whole concept of crazy mode versus ready mode came. Now, ready mode, I think then is the opposite of crazy mode. And I remember yes. you said that to get into ready mode, there are three things we should all do. Mm -hmm. One is to relentlessly triage, which is what you do in the emergency room. The mm -hmm. other is to expect and design for crazy. <laughs> the third is to get out of our own heads. Mm -hmm. So can you walk us through how do we take those three steps? Yes. Yes. And the big point for all of the listeners is being in crazy mode, being in that state of chronic stress, it doesn't just feel badly. Of course, it feels awful. Um, but it actually, when you're in that crazy mode, your ex studies have shown your executive function declines, your ability to ju have judgment declines, your anxiety and anger are just like primed, and which is why you all feel, we all, all of us feel like we're just like ready to blow at any point. So it's not that it doesn't feel good. Of course, it doesn't feel good. It actually means you, you just can't function as well. We can't afford that in the ER. And right now, none of us can afford that in our lives. So Petal, you had asked what are kind of the three, um, three things. So I'll jump in right now uh, on to relentlessly triage. And again, a lot of these, all these lessons come from the ER because what better place where you're constantly pushed to the edge and we have to figure out how to function, how to keep cool. We're not magic. We've trained for it and there's a system. So like, we can take this to our own lives. So relentlessly triage means looking at everything on your to-do list, just like I have my to-do list right here. And instead of saying, oh, there's 20 things on there, I'm never gonna get all of them, say, okay, what are my reds? So in the ER, we triage. Red means uh, severe, most important, most critical. 
Yellow means critical, but not as immediately so. And green is minor. And this isn't just a nice way of getting your to-do list done. Studies have shown that when, um, actually in primates, when they're not able to differentiate red versus yellow versus green, and they just interpret everything as if it's red, they have double the level of cortisol. And that's in double level of stress hormones. And that's what's happening. When you're in crazy busy mode, you're interpreting everything on your to-do list as if it is red. So instead, we've got to be smart and say, what are my things? What are my two most important things to do today? Because let's be honest, right now with homeschooling and homeworking and all the stuff, yeah. we're not going to get 10 things done today. So you have to start off your day saying, what are my two reds? And that is what I'm going to get done. And I'm not going to let the greens and maybe the yellows, I'm not going to let them distract me from what I need to get done. Because then you can look at the end of the day and say, I moved the needle. And that makes all the difference. So that's the triage part of it. What about expecting and designing for crazy? How do we do that? So, yes, because the reality is it, if you expect life to be chaotic right now, then it's, it's not really a surprise. You say, okay, how can I plan for this? How can I plan and expect that tomorrow my child will have a tantrum when I, instead of them doing the perfectly pristine schedule that I planned for them. Because what's the reality? Like, what's going to happen? They're going to have a tantrum. They're not going to yep. stick to this perfect, pristine schedule that you wrote up on your poster board, color coordinated. I mean, anybody listening saying, amen, if you've done that, because you know everybody has done that at some point. Um, so how do I plan for our plan Bs and Cs and Ds in a way that when they arise, instead of me saying, oh, something is wrong with me, something is wrong with the scenario, saying, no, I expected bumps, so how can I handle it? So for everybody, these are different, but what are your bumps that get in the way of your goals? So for some people, that means saying, you know, they have plans for the day, but it's like the little things, those little recurrent phone calls, those recurrent emails, those recurrent meetings, and they forget to reschedule them and they fall off the calendar and it just takes brain power. So one thing is, what are all the things that are recurrent? How can you schedule that and automate as much as possible? That's designing for chaos is saying, what can I automate? What can I make a routine so that I'm decreasing the number of decisions I'm making every single day? So that's one big thing. Another big thing, for instance, people say, you know, I had a goal to eat well today. But then, you know, I got hungry or it was 6 p.m. and it was Tuesday at 6 p.m. Everybody's hangry. And next thing I know, I'm like ripping open some frozen pizza and like feeding everybody Cheetos. Well, oh, let's plan fun. for that. Let's plan for the fact that when it's Tuesday at 6 p.m., everybody's hangry. You're exhausted. You're pissed off because you have to stop doing something and you have three phone calls still to do. So instead, how do we plan for that? Like, how can you meal plan? On Sunday, I always meal plan on Sunday, and people think, "Oh, she meal plans. She must be so organic and a homebody." Like, no. For, I used to do the meal plan with the family as we're driving to church, and on the way home from church, we pick up groceries. It's not anything major, but. I know on Sunday what we're eating for the rest of the week. And I make sure we have the groceries there at the house so that there's no panicking of we're out of an ingredient right. or it's not prepared. So that Tuesday at 6 p.m. Again, step two is about designing for chaos, which literally just means you're designing for how can I decrease the number of decisions I have to make every day. So when it's Tuesday at 6 p.m., you have no decisions to make to get a healthy meal on the table. And that's what step two is all about. All of those routine decisions that are like little tiny razors on your brain every single day, eating away at your cognitive function. You're saying, here's what I can routinize so I have less decisions to make. Makes sense. How do we get out of our own heads? That's a little bit tricky in my mind, I think. This is one of the most important ones. And uh, when I talked about this in my TED Talk, this was the hardest one to say, how do I do this? Because part of it is seeing what I do in the ER, but then how, how do I teach that? Mm -hmm. And um, I remember being in residency and we were running a code, which means a patient was in cardiac arrest. And it was my, we had nurses and other doctors and, and respiratory therapy and other techs drawing blood and people doing CPR. And it was my job to say, okay, stop CPR, check the pulse, give medication, do this, do that. Let's start, restart CPR and make those decisions. And afterwards, the intern, my intern turned to me and he said, you were so calm in there. How did you do it? And I remember I said, Doug, what would have happened if I had started flipping out? And he started laughing. He's like, oh, everybody would have flipped out. I was like, yeah, you, you, we can't do that. So one is being aware, like I'm very aware now as a mother that my tone sets my children's tone. How they see me react is how they're going to learn to react. So that's one is that was to understand like, this is really important. Um, 
but then, so when you're in that moment, so there's two things to kind of get out of your head. One is what I do in the ER when I start to be really stressed, you know, there's 13 different things. There's a patient having a stroke and then this patient having a heart attack and then somebody else and they're coming in in labor is I, we all start to cast catastrophize. Oh, I can't do this. There's too much. I'm too busy. Instead, how do you get out of your own head? One of the ways, there's a bunch of different ways, mindfulness, a lot of things. I just focus on the person who needs me. Like this patient needs me right now. And that helps me very much to say, to get out of my own head of, I can't handle this. This is too much to do. This is just nothing because it suddenly personalizes it. So maybe you're doing work. Maybe it's your client. Maybe it's your child. So like, they need me right now. My child isn't having a tantrum to give me a hard time. She's having a tantrum because she's having a hard time. Mm-hmm. She needs me. So you're leaning into that other person. I think that makes a really big difference. And I think there's one other thing that we all need to be doing right now. And that is we're telling people to take their temperature for COVID. I think we all need to take our emotional temperature because we, if 10 is where we're going to lose it and everybody's having those moments right now, I think we're all humming it around to seven or eight. And we can talk about this more. Um, but you need to take your emotional temperature because when you're at a seven or eight, that's when you need to say, I'm going to disengage right now because yeah. I know if I get to a 10, I'm just going to lose my mind. So how do I disengage? How do I go? take a moment because that's okay right now. Mm -hmm. So all of this makes complete sense to me. What is uh, a bit more puzzling, I guess, is the fact that, you know, this virus kind of came out of nowhere for most of the world, um, you know, and we had to immediately take very drastic measures, very much like you have had to do in the ER. Uh, we had to take drastic measures to try to contain it. And, um, and then there are impacts and effects of those measures. What has happened is that we kind of got into crazy mode before we could even think it through or or, or prepare for ready mode. And so I guess my question to you is, if we're already in crazy mode, which I already said to you, I think is where I am, um, how do we get out of it? And and I want you to actually answer this um, in the context of some experiences that some of our listeners are having. So... I'm going to give you the examples of, of the experiences and then you'll, you'll, you'll help us counsel them because they are in crazy mode right now. So yeah. let's start with someone who is a successful business owner. She has um, a, a high-end confectionery business, 100 employees, several storefronts, uh, retail stores. And within a week or two of, of the, the impacts of the virus starting to be felt, she had to close most of her stores, uh, lay off uh, something like 90% of her employees. What is she to do now? Every Business owners everywhere, whatever size they are, and not business owners, everybody. Everybody is feeling the impact of this virus. And I think one of the most important things is we have different worries, but we need to separate them out because we need to give name to what is concerning us because then we can give name to what is in our control and what is not. Um, So I think there's three big kind of spheres of concern when it comes to COVID. There's the medical, like, am I going to catch COVID? Is my family going to catch COVID? Is my employee going to catch COVID? There is the financial of, I've just laid off 90% of my people. What does that mean for them? What does that mean for me and my business when people aren't coming out you know, I, I, the idea of a confectionery store makes me smile. I'm like, oh, I want to go there, but nobody's going to them right now. So how do you have that financial? And then there's the logistics of what do I actually do? How do I apply for this PPP? How do we reopen? When will we reopen? How do we get testing? All these different things. So I think we have to separate them out because when I see people start to guess most fear and when that panic and crazy mode is one of those things becomes a vicious cycle, just like catastrophization, it's yeah. because we're mixing all of those together. So I think for that, um, for that sort of business person is to look at the three different things and say, okay, in each of these, what is in my control? Because there, there are those things that are not in our control right now. We just have to let them go. What is in my control? And then what can I do about each of them? So medically, you know, is it truly in our control whether you catch COVID? No, but in many ways it is. You can empower yourself with knowledge and say, how do I, what, what are the steps I need to do to reduce my risk of catching COVID or that of my family? Um, or at least wait until long enough, which is the point of lockdown as we're just trying to extend the sickness, people sick, so it's not all at once. So we've had time to know how to treat people and how to test people by the time people slowly get sick and we can better address it. 
Um, what are the financial implications? That's a really hard question. I am fortunately not a financial analyst during this time. I would not want to. I think that's very hard. <laughs> yeah. um, I get to defer it on that one. And then on the logistics. So I think that person also needs to start planning. We don't know when we're going back, but what are the steps that need to be taken to go back? Who are, and that is, who are the employees who will be going back first? You decide that in part based on role, but you also decide that in part based on their risk factors. You know, the healthiest employees who are probably have the strongest health will go back first. People who may have immunity should go back first. People right. who are most essential should go back first. And then how do you create, once we stop social distancing, I think we'll still have social spacing, which yeah. means we keep some degree of distance because we know catching the virus is not binary. It's not that you were exposed and you catch it. There's more of a continuum. One study just came out, Petal, and you may have seen it. They said that um, they found that if you are living in a home with somebody who has COVID while they're convalescing, you have about a 75% chance of catching it. Mm -hmm. If you only live in the home with them until you, they know they have it, your chances decrease significantly to you know, about half of that. Um, I don't remember the exact number, but about half of that. But then if you're actually, so go even less to the contact, if you have less than 15 minutes face-to-face -face time with that person, your chances are 5%. So exposure is not binary. And we're going to have to look at that. And that's what I think employers like this confectioner should say, what are the high risk exposures? How do I cut those off? But then what are my low risk ones and say, okay, how do we increase this? So we're protecting our employees and our clients as much as possible. And I think if we start to make plans for that, that starts to empower people so that when we get the go ahead, we need to already be ready to get back to business. And I think that's what employers need to be doing. So you you had to take a pass, and I understand that on the financial piece of, of that particular um, person's experience. And um, the other person I was going to talk about is someone who works as a nanny or a housekeeper, and her job is to go to people's homes, to care for their homes, to care for their children. Her employers have said, you need to stay home, you know, for your own safety for hours, um, you know. Some of them uh, have not said anything to her about, about paying her, um, and she has her own family to, to take care of. Um, one idea that I had for her, because I think, you know, I have, I have a nanny too, I, I, you know, I have someone who helps me at home, it's part of what I do, it's part of how I run my household, and the fact that, you know, COVID has come and the person cannot actually come safely to my home should not stop me from from paying her because yeah. she this is her livelihood and and so one idea i had for this person was talk to your employers and say you know please remember this is how i live and yes yeah. i can't be with you um but what else can she do um yeah probably that's not as finance focused. I run a small business myself now. So I, these are issues. I, I wanted to give a pass on the financial, but you're not gonna let me have a pass on the financial. So fine, because it's fair. People who help me and in, in my household and other places and a lot of other people I've spoken to have said, they're continuing to pay their nanny if their nanny still cannot come. That is that person's sole source of income. So that's one thing. Um, Number two, that if, if an employer refuses absolutely to pay with the PPP um, and other small business loans, I think I, believe, I do believe that that nanny could be able to, assuming they've been making a W-2 or a 1099, could be able to file as an individual for loss of wages. Don't know all the details, but I'm pretty sure if they have tax documents showing their uh, income for the last year, they can do something like that. And then I think who goes back to work is very based on um, need. So I'm an emergency room doctor. My husband's a doctor. If we, you know, we are declared essential. And then the last, uh, several weeks ago, they said that um, we had our, our lockdown. So what do we do if, if my nanny cannot come here? I can't take my kids to the ER. Right. I don't have family nearby that can just drop in and watch my children. Fortunately for us, uh, the, they deem that child care for essential employees is allowed. Okay. Uh, so every state is different. And so for us, we've had to take that you know, educated risk of saying, well, we do have to have the nanny because otherwise we can't work, period. Um, and so how do I then make sure that the person watching my children is I'm making sure that they are very much isolating and that she's protected, that she has a mask. It's 
I protect this person because they're as much a part of my family as my family. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the other thing as an employer, when you're looking at your employees, those that you do want to keep on the payroll and those are you are having work is how do you make sure that they are as healthy as possible? So, cause we got to, we have to watch out for each other and that includes our families and our employees. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you for that. So I have another scenario for you. Okay. There's a young man. He is a professional student. He might be in med school or law school or, or what have you. And, um, he and his partner have two young children who are not school aged children. So unlike many of us whose kids are still going to school <laughs> by Zoom, he's not, he doesn't have that. They're very young. His partner happens to be the head of IT uh, at a major corporation. So as you can imagine, his partner is working 24-7. Now he is at home as well, schooling online, exams are online, and these two little kids. How does he get out of crazy mode? Okay. So in this situation, I think you have to do some peer, serious like partners taking shifts. For instance, one per parent says, okay, I take the kids and you work from 6 a.m. to 2. And I watch the kids during that time and then switch from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. We switch and then you do work. And I've, that's, I think people have to get really creative during that to say like, here, here's our shifts because Otherwise, it's very difficult. You're trying to do work at the kitchen table. You're trying to study for med school or law school or whatever, and your child's jumping up and down in your lap. It's next to impossible. So whether you're carving out four hours or eight hours, whatever you as a family can allow each other to carve out, I think that's very crucial during this time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my kids are young too. Like, I, they're not sitting in front of the Zoom all day long. I, I can't do it. They're, they're three and six. They'd be running in right now. So I think you really have to say, you carve out your time. And then, you know, we need to give ourselves a little bit of grace in terms of screen time. Patel, I'm usually the one who's like, here's your screen time. They need to have healthy screen time and we need to watch out. Yeah, All rules are off right now. In the window. Yeah. Study, <laughs> if you have to study for an exam or you have some server crashing and your work demands you, I think... Part of crazy mode, remember, second step is designing for crazy. Part of that means my plan B means when I have nobody to watch my kids and I got to take 30 minutes and do something, whether it's something for work or because I'm just about to lose my mind, I need to go scream <laughs> into a pillow. What are the 10 things my kids can do without me? Right. One may be sitting in front of the TV and watching Moana. I don't know. There's mm -hmm. other cool things. There's one thing I saw that um, it's asked what is it called? Story t stories from space. Stories you, from space. On yeah. YouTube. And literally it's an astronaut reading a story. She's like floating around in yep. space. I have a six-year-old daughter. So I thought it was so cool. Be like, she's in space right now. <laughs> she loves math and science. And that's how you get there. Now she's reading you a story. So I tell everybody, come up with 10 things that if you need to buy yourself a half hour, you yeah. can go hand to your kids and say, go do that and let them do it. Whatever it is, how, that's part of that designing for chaos is knowing what's going to happen, expecting that that's going to happen. Yeah, and you'll do. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, I try to um, alleviate my guilt a little bit by trying to make sure that what they are enjoying or what 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 you know what they're looking at, and that's particularly my toddler. I have a four year old and I have a thirteen year old, and the, so the thirteen year old is in school all day on Zoom, which is which has its own ramifications. But for the little one. I try to at least make sure that what she's enjoying is um, is educational, it's fun, it's art, it's, you know, maybe it's in another language that she's learning, what have you. That helps a little bit because I'm like, well, at least her brain is not dead. <laughs> her brain's not going to mush. And you know what? It won't go to mush. This is two months. If it happens for two months. So get your list of 10 things, bookmark them all on your child's iPad so that you yeah. can just buy yourself some time uh, in case of emergency, go do it. So one last scenario. This is now a middle-aged high school teacher. Um, she is estranged from her family. She is not married or does not have a partner, does not have children. Um, but she actually has a good life. She loves the impact that she has on her students. Uh, she's a little bit prone to depression, but she actually does very well. She goes to the gym three or four times a week for group classes. And then she has a really rich social life. Um, you know, she goes out during the week sometimes, definitely on weekends. She meets people online. She connects in many ways. Now it's COVID, time of COVID. She's indoors. She does see her students uh, online uh, for periods of the day. But her entire sort of social framework is gone. Um, and she's on her own. She's kind of losing it. 
what do you have to say to her? So, you know, it's really interesting. Your examples kind of have gone through. We've talked about medical concerns, financial concerns, logistics was that last one with the professional yeah. students. I think a fourth one is kind of like emotional connectedness. Correct. Um, and I would say for her, two things. She clearly is deriving in, in normal times, uh, emotional connectedness and fulfillment, one from her students, who she's now distanced from, and then two from this uh, intricate social web she has created. And so I would say, where do you find those things that fill your cup and how do we very deliberately reconstruct them again? Um, for her students, I know a lot of teachers are so concerned about their students, what their students are missing, um, you know, proms and graduations and, and sports meets that, or thing, school, scholastic things for which they've trained and prepared their whole lives. And I think high school's really hard time. Yeah. In many ways, Patel, I'm grateful my kids are three and six. For them, the worst part is missing a play date. I think it's a lot harder in high school. So for that teacher, I would say, I could lean into that. So your high school students are missing a lot. How can you enrich their lives right now? How can you maybe plan for something when they're, when we're out of this lockdown, how can you help them feel that they're not just losing out from this moment? What kind of enrichment can we get? There's some interesting anecdotes of people who in times like this have really risen to the occasion. Um, Isaac Newton apparently was a was a decent student at Cambridge, and then there was I believe it was the plague, and his school got closed down for two years. Where he sat at his parents' home and came up with a little nifty theory that we were to refer to as the law of gravity right now. Right. So the truth is, there are silver linings. So you know, and we're seeing some really amazing things. So lean into that with your high school students. What can they develop right now that? you know, maybe they before didn't have time to, what can they do? So I think that teacher really could have a really, she knows her students so intricately. I say, let that be your teaching mission for each of your students as individuals. What can each of them dive into to find something to come out of this time? So I think that would help her as a teacher. Um, and I think as an individual, how can you connect, lean into the, those Zoom calls, reconnect with your friends, phone calls, do all those things because we should not let physical disconnect lead us to being emotionally disconnected. If we do, we can handle physical connection as long as we all stay emotionally connected with our community, keep that connection. So find ways to do that and other groups and your friends and lean into that. I think this is a wonderful segue actually into um, this part of the conversation where I want to focus in a little bit on, on parenting. This is after all, uh, all about how we parent for a better future for all our children. Um, and I really love what you said about the emotional connection because I also know from my own experience that leaning in to help others has such enormous benefits for those of us who do it. Um, you know, there is a, a fulfillment and a joy and a sense of purpose that actually comes from almost putting your own needs uh, aside, so to speak, um, you're fulfilling them actually by, by helping others. So I like that a lot. Um, I want to go back to crazy mode a little bit because I, I do think that um, there are a number of things you said earlier about your own emotional response to things and how it impacts your children. So I think it's really important for us to know, just in case we're still wondering if we actually could get out of crazy mode or if it's too difficult, how does being in crazy mode impact our children? Petal, you made a very important point there. Every single one of us can get out of crazy mode. It doesn't mean getting out of crazy mode doesn't mean we're all going to go start you know, meditating like the Buddha over in a corner. Um, if, if I knew how to do that, I, we'd all make a million dollars right now, honey. Um, but it means that you're able to, again, say that I can handle this. I know the one next step and I'm going to do it. And then after I do that one step, I'm going to do the next step. And I'm not going to worry about 30 steps down the road. I'm right. do one at a time. Um, and I think you mentioned thinking about others. So your question was, how do we not let our crazy mode lean in, bleed over into our children? And is one is, is focusing on yourself to your internal, taking your internal temperature and focusing on your internal mentality. And again, that's hard. That's why for me, I focus on other people because there's a lot of people different say different things. When you are feeling like you're about to melt down 
there's a number of different things. You can do that square breathing where you inhale for four seconds, hold it for four seconds, exhale four seconds, hold it four seconds. Do that a couple of times. You can do another thing where people, some people hold one nostril and breathe in one nostril and then let it out. You know, let one nostril off at a time so you don't hold your breath. But uh, it's alternate nostril breathing. You can do that. I think you can find your own outlets. And earlier I said to take your emotional temperature because once we get to 10 and we're about to lose it, it doesn't matter if you are the Dalai Lama, you're not going to be able to calm yourself down. But when you're at seven or eight and you feel like I'm about to lose it, I can't. And everybody listening here is probably like, when I get to seven, I try to power through it. No. I want people to stop trying to power through it. When they get to a seven or eight, I want them to disengage. So I'm going to take a minute and I'm going to go do whatever it is you do that helps you, whether it's work out, go outside, punch a pillow, hug your child, whatever it is, is to find that outlet. And then that last one I mentioned, just you just said it, Petal, is compassion. Because sometimes I get so, we can all get so caught up in our head, but if we look at and see the person in front of us and that they need us, then it means that instead of yelling about, I don't know, toilet paper in front of your six-year-old, which they may perceive as yelling at them, yeah. you, you just crouch on and hug them and you don't do anything else. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. And that is the biggest thing. When I am really, really stressed, how I get out of my own head is just, just, just compassion. Lean into what the other person needs. And instead of trying to be stoic about it, mm-hmm. just just to give, give them a hug, give, experience that connection. We know when you experience connection, physical touch, it releases oxytocin. It helps from a stress perspective. So those are kind of some different things that I do in, in real time. I was talking to another friend of mine um, who's a psychologist, uh, Yal Melamed. She's amazing. I advise everybody to check out her stuff. She's, she's so much, she's the Zen I aspire to be. Um, so she was, she was talking to me about rupture and repair because I had had a moment, I had several weeks ago, I'd gone to one grocery store, they had like a third of what I needed. So I went to another grocery store, they had most of what I needed. Finally getting home, I haven't gotten to spend any time with my kids. I just wanted to be with my kids. I get home, I open up the car, I'm like, finally, I'll finish this. And I'll, and I, at this point, I'm like a seven yeah. um, mentally. I'm like, but I'm just gonna power through it. I'm gonna unload this and spend time with my children. I open the door, all the dish detergent, the laundry detergent that I had just gone to the second store to buy, falls out and breaks and spills all over my garage. I lost it. I just started bawling my eyes out. My husband came and he's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, you know, I'm like detergent. I'm like detergent. Um, And so I was mad. And so I was like, I said, I'm going back. And I went back to the store and I got more detergent. We all experience those moments where we rupture. And But what matters then is if you rupture and just let it go and never say anything, then you can harm relationships. But if you repair, studies show that actually your relationship will be stronger. So again, I came back, I had the detergent, I went for a run because I knew I was like, you know, I'm at a 10. I need to just, I need to try to just not push through this anymore. I need to go to my outlet. I need to go for a run. I told my kids, I love you, but mommy just needs to step out for 20 minutes. Um, And I came back. I hugged my children. I said, listen, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I did that. Mommy was really stressed. Sorry I said that. I, I'm sorry I yelled. And you know, my daughter was like, mommy, it's okay. You don't have to be so stressed. And so again, we, if you rupture, which we all do, I want all the listeners to know everybody is rupturing right now. And that's okay. Instead of giving yourself a guilt trip, because I have girlfriends and fr- people who are constantly messaging me on Instagram and different places saying that they had these breakdowns, go back and repair. Go back to that person that you yelled at or whatever you said, apologize, yeah. tell them what you want to try to do better and know that if you do that, you actually make the relationship stronger. So we can get rid of that guilt for those breakdowns we're all having. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, this is, that's just wonderful. I'm so happy you touched on that because yeah, <laughs> I think all of us <laughs> were there. We're there. I hear from people every day. You know, I, yeah. I lost it and I yelled at my family and it was about, you know, it's about something that has, has, has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> Everybody is doing it and it's okay. Disengage until you're ready to repair because you may not be ready to repair right at that moment. Disengage, come back, repair. What other things have you done in your own family life to, uh, to actually celebrate the fact that you're together, you're healthy, um, you have what you need, even as all of this uncertainty and all of this pain um, is surrounding us. 
Yeah, I've been trying to do that um, for me. And I know probably for many of your listeners, this is actually a far busier time than normal because between, you know, there's ER shifts, but also doing so much media right now and TV interviews and, and your interview and things. Um, so how do I carve out time? So one of the things is, well, now my schedule, our, all of our schedules are, are kind of really under my control in that way because nobody's commuting, nobody's doing activities. So what are the carve outs? So I have lunch with my children. Around 3 p.m., I try to take some time off to go play with the kids again. So what are the things that we're carving out? And then trying to say, you know what? I, I look, I do, Pitel, I look on Instagram and there are these moms and they're like doing, today's smash paint and tomorrow we're making flowers out of leaves and socks and stuff. And, you know, I'm like, who, do you, who thought of that? Like, who, who, who what? Um, and, but I'm not letting myself feel guilty about it. I was like, okay, but every couple of days, like, let's do something fun or something special. Yesterday, we made a, uh, a volcano using... Um, baking soda and but we added soap as an experiment it makes it more foamy oh. there you go so trying to have little moments like that so that we look back you know and we look back at this time like and we have a whiteboard in our kitchen where we write down what were the fun things we did that day mm. and I think for all of us um we have to take those moments because otherwise our brains remember the negative. They, that we're evolutionally wired to remember what could be poisonous because it could kill you. Um, right. We're not evolutionally wired to remember the positive. And right now when we're so flooded with negative, I think we have to be even more deliberate. What were the good things? I, I write it down in, in my little notebook um, or write it down on a whiteboard. What were the good things that happened so that our brains we truly start programming our brains that way. If you force yourself to write it down, your brain starts to look during the day, not just for the threats that are going to kill us, but say, oh, what are some good things I can write down on the whiteboard tonight or in my journal? I think deliberately finding those moments of gratitude, it sounds cliche, but brain research, neuroplasticity research shows us that it really does change our brain. And I think we have to do that. I do that in the middle of the ER. I say in the middle of this ER shift, what is the, I just want one good interaction with a patient, one moment. And I look for that. And those one moment in the middle of a nine hour shift of one moment with a patient is what gets me through. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think is going to get all of us through are those little small moments amidst this otherwise chaos. That's what gets us out of our heads, out of crazy mode. Mm -hmm. This is really great, uh, Dr. Daria, because, you know, I, I think that even you know, when all of this started to happen and we had to all change so much so quickly um, and, and, and in very drastic ways for, for many people, um, I think that, yeah, you, you forgot that you do have some control. And, and I think there are some days when I feel like that and I forget, well, actually, there is some good in this that you can carve time out, that you can say I'm not available at, from this time to that time. Um, you can try to do whatever you can to rest control back so that you can focus on the things that matter most in the end. So we are at, you know, sort of the, the last part of this. And I always, with every conversation that I have on the podcast uh, or today, I don't know what we're calling this, a video blog or whatever we're doing. Um, <laughs> I always, <laughs> I always ask about our goal, which is to raise our children to thrive, but also to make their own unique contribution to the world so that the world becomes a better place for all of us uh, and for them as they grow. And so one of the things that this pandemic has revealed are the very deep inequities in our society. We all kind of know that they are there. Many of us live uh, or experience these inequities, but it, it really is in stark relief now. And so whatever age ages we, you know, our children are, how can we help them actually recognize and appreciate and understand that, you know, what we're seeing is actually a problem? You know, these are these are choices that we've made made as societies, and here are the ramifications of those. So that's one question. So that's the first piece. And then secondly, how can we help them, even as we expose them to these things or have, help them appreciate that they exist, also appreciate the responsibility that they and us, all of us have, to really alleviate uh, these inequities and injustices so that we have a better future for all of them and for their children and, and so on? Yeah, I, I think those, are, those sort of questions are really kind of pivotal to what parenting is. And I think... You know, I heard of one parent saying, you know, 
I wanted to protect my children and they're being ex- exposed to all these harsh realities right now. Mm. I don't think my job as a parent is to protect them from everything out there that's a harsh reality. My job as a parent is to let them understand that those harsh realities exist at an age appropriate, you know, not like, sorry, kid, that's life, (laughs) at an age appropriate level so they can see that they, not just me to help them handle it, but that they can handle it. Mm. That's really important. That's the foundation of resilience. It's that resilience doesn't come from never experiencing bad. Resilience comes from experiencing bad in small aliquots where you still felt safe yeah. and you were able to come out of it. I think that's really crucial. They have to feel safe um, and they have to feel that you got their back, but that you know, you're, you're, you're the mama eagle saying, look at the edge of the nest. You know, can, can you fly? If not, yeah, I, I'm going to catch them. Yes, of course. But, but look at that is resilience. It is not protecting them from everything. Um, so letting your child see what's happening at an age appropriate level that doesn't scare them where they can still feel safe. And then saying, okay, what can we do about it? I, my kids see that mommy goes, you know, I, I do two things. I try to teach people uh, on media and, you know, I got, I was doing CNN the other day and got a really cool tweet from a guy in Kenya wow. saying he's watching me on CNN and that I was had helped him and was teaching the world. And so I showed that to my daughter and said, we may feel powerless at times, but you find where your power is. Look from my little, literally my office in the corner of my house, we just talked to somebody in Kenya, Yeah, what you can do and, or, you know, going into the hospital and helping people when they are sick, look what you can do, find that it's, you know, once they, we, this quarantine is lifted, of course, I think that's the importance of having your child do volunteer work and service and seeing what else exists, but they're seeing it in a way that is not a hopeless way, but see what exists. And now let's see what we can do to figure out how to solve it. I think that's resilience, that's strength. That's how to make your children grow up to be crusaders for justice and equity. Yeah, I, I love that a lot and I appreciate that. And um, I do know that there are some families who are, you know, trying to do other things like make sandwiches for, for people like you, doctors and people on the front lines. And, and, I, and I think all of these really would come together to help us with this goal that we have. I, I love the word crusaders um, to create st- children who really own their own uh, talents and, and propensities and own them in a way uh, that they feel empowered to, to, to have impact, positive impact, I might add. So thank you for being with us. There's a lot of wisdom in this conversation and um, I took a lot of notes. So I'm going to be, <laughs> I'm not going to be in crazy mode for much longer. Good girl. Yay. <laughs> And, um, and I also want to thank you, Dr. Dariar, for what you are doing on the front lines of the pandemic. It is just not easy to be a healthcare professional these days, but it is such important work. Um, it is what is keeping all of us going, just looking at all of you, understanding what you're going through, understanding what you're up against. Uh, you mentioned your husband is a doctor. Thank him for all of us. We appreciate it. We appreciate you. And, um, and we really hope that maybe when this is all over, we get you back again. This has been a very important conversation for all of us to have as parents in this time. So thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank very- you, Patel. It was such a pleasure. Thank you for the work you're doing for all of your audience. And, you know, please tell everybody, I, I've realized that the best way to help people stay up to date during this time that's otherwise pretty scary is just on Instagram. So I'm having people submit questions to me on Instagram and as many as I can, I either answer on CNN or I do a story on it because people need science. They need non-politicized, non-polarized, true answers called science with a little dose of sanity to help them know what to expect, how to protect themselves, how to keep their family safe. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And they can just find you on Instagram as Dr. Daria, correct? Yes, D-R-D-A-R-R-I-A. It's the same as my address on my website and Twitter and Facebook everywhere, but Instagram is where I'm really leaning in now, Dr. Daria. All right. I'm sure many will contact you. Thank you again. Really appreciate it. And thank you all for joining us. This has, this has been really wonderful uh, to, to see that you continue to support us in this very challenging time. Those of you who are new to Parenting for the Future, please find us on social media. Uh, find us at www.petalmodest.com. Follow us, subscribe, share, and please give us your own ideas and, and let us know how you're doing. Take good care, everybody. Be healthy. Bye-bye.